Welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you watch this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go if you would like to access helpful growth step resources, join a serving team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear one of our Church Experience Worship original songs, and we hope that gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned. Thanks again for joining us at Church Experience Online. We are going to continue our Grow Steps teaching series today, and we're going to wrap it up next Sunday, and I hope you'll be here for it. But today we're going to tackle a topic that I'll be honest with you, is it's a difficult one. It's a multifaceted one, but if you, can, if you can win this, you can really accelerate your growth in your relationship with God. Today we're talking about experiencing health. So let's jump in and do like we've done every week. Let's go off location and begin this week's Grow Step teaching. You know, most people that add a boat to their life, they do it because they want to add some fun. And boats can be a lot of fun. I remember a time when I was a young kid going out on a lake in Indiana with my grandfather, and he would take me fishing, and man, it was so much fun. I also remember a time when I took my young kids down south of Venice Beach, and we were going along the water and enjoying the day, and we look out and we see this incredible boat race going on. I'm talking about large speedboats skipping across the water, a helicopter following overhead, and a crowd lined along the shore. I mean, it was incredible to watch. You know, boats can be a lot of fun, but more likely than not, if you see a boat on the news, it could be a boat race, but it's probably instead because something bad happened. Maybe a storm that capsized the boat. Maybe it was an engine failure, some technical problem that caused the boat to sink. Perhaps it was an inexperienced operator who wrecked the boat. See, fun can very quickly turn into failure. Isn't that how it happens in our lives? God wanted us to have fun holistically and honor Him with our finances, our fitness, how we have fun. But if we mishandle those things, they can so easily frustrate our lives, even devastate our lives. And, and what you focus your life on when it comes to these three areas of fun, fitness, and finances, it really does make a difference. In fact, it was the great theologian C.S. Lewis who said, don't let your happiness depend on things that you can lose. And so often we get attached to things like finances, our health, fitness, you know, how we have fun, our hobbies, the things we enjoy, and we start to focus our lives on those things and our joy tends to swing on how those things are going. Well, the reality is that we can lose any one of those things at any time in this life. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. You know, so many people are chasing what they would call a good life and what appears to be a good life. And they're chasing things like fun, like finances, like fitness, like, like having a good long life. And none of those things in themselves are inherently wrong to possess in your life. But when they become the focus of your life, fun can so easily turn to failure. You know, it's interesting, it says that there's a way that appears to be right to a man. You know, have you ever experienced a big surprise? Maybe someone snuck up on you and scared you? I've learned not to scare my wife. She doesn't like it when I do that, but when we first got married, I'd love to hide around a corner and jump out and scare her. And I realized real quickly that maybe that's not a good idea. But man, when you surprise someone, it's fun when you're on the, on the giving end. But it can be not so fun when you're on the receiving end and you get a bad surprise. Maybe you're focused on living a long life and accomplishing a lot of things here on this life and you get a bad doctor's report. You didn't expect that, it's a surprise. And you were living your life for the here and now, not thinking of eternity. And it appeared like things were going well, but then you got a surprise. Or maybe you were focused on finances and you were, instead of honoring God with your finances and, and viewing everything that you own as His, you viewed it as something that was for your benefit and you were living for more and more and more and then, and then maybe an economic crash came along or you lost a job and you realized that everything you were living for was not all that you hoped it would be and it appeared as it was life-giving and it ended up being life-taking. See, there's, there's a way that seems right, that appears right and how we live this life, 
but but when we focus our life on holistically being healthy before God and honoring God, we can live a fulfilling life. But when you give your worship to the created things of this world, not only can it frustrate and devastate you, but it can shipwreck your life. Our hope is that you will honor God in all these areas and experience health. So how do you experience a great life in Jesus Christ? How do you fulfill all that God wants to do in and through your life? Well, today, if there's one thing that I could help us all grab a hold of and run with, it would be this idea of experiencing health. Because as you become more healthy and more God-honoring with every holistic aspect of your life, you're freed up to really chase after what God wants to do in your life. So experiencing health is incredibly important. We're going to continue this message by looking into Galatians chapter 6. And uh, Paul, a man who was inspired by God, he was a missionary, and he, he wrote this book to the church in Galatia. And now, it was meant for them, but it was also meant for us. And, and these people in Galatia, it was a mixed group of people. There were Romans, Greeks. There was uh, some Celtic people that were mixed in and were the predominant group in that, that church and that group of people. And they descended from the Gauls who had sacked Rome in the 3rd and 4th centuries. And, and this group of people, I think, was a lot like us. You know, they, they were... They were opinionated, and they were, they were fickle, they were impulsive, they were quick-tempered, and these particular people, Paul is writing to them in this book of Galatians, and he's, he's given them some very clear direction on how to live for Jesus, and I, I think you're going to see a lot of us in this, and it's so important that we, we grasp the truth here he's communicating. He writes, Paul writes, inspired by God, he says, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So here the Lord is saying that there's a natural cycle that happens in nature with plants. You you. you you, har- you uh, sow, you plant, you wait, and then you harvest. You sow, you plant, wait, you harvest. And as you go through this cycle in nature, you, you get, if everything goes well, you get a byproduct. You get a healthy living thing. You get something that's growing. And in our spiritual lives, the same is true. There's a, a process that naturally happens for a follower of Jesus as you follow, follow him. There's a, there's a planting season, there's a, a growing season, and, there, and then there's harvest, there's fruit, which is a byproduct in our lives, there's, there's accomplishment for God's kingdom, there's results. And, and here, Paul says, do not get weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. We will. You, you, can, you can bank on it, you can count on it, that if you're faithful, you'll be fruitful. You'll, you'll see good things happen, but you, you have to be healthy, you have to, you have to honor God in, in the waiting. In your notes, I'd encourage you to write this down as we talk about experiencing health. And that's that God-honoring discipline or a lack of it will either reward you or it'll ruin you. It'll either reward you or it'll ruin you. And now you know this, right? You've experienced this, that, that when you were disciplined in your life and when you, when you honored God and you were following him, that, that you saw a reward from that. But you also know that when you, when you left the path and you were undisciplined and you kind of did your own thing, that it, it kind of ruined you. It ruined the good that you were chasing. And, and there's three different areas today that we're going to go after, our fitness, our finances, and our fun. And every one of these areas has potential to do one of two things, to reward us or ruin us based on how we approach it. So it's such an important topic as we talk about experiencing health. So let's go ahead and jump into this first one, fitness. And maybe you want to write that down and maybe write a few other things down as we're talking in this conversation that maybe God will put on your heart on on things you need to change, things you need to do. We uh, have lived before in a construction zone. I I know what it's like to to live in a house that's being worked on. And we are in Michigan. I I shared with some of you before that our house had uh, two accidents that happened on back-to-back days that were both crazy, enough to drive you crazy. One of them is our, our sump pump in our basement failed and flooded our basement. Now, if you grew up in Florida, you know nothing about sump pumps and basements, 
But up north, many houses have basements, and you need a sump pump in many of them to keep the water out of the basement. Well, ours backed up, and there was a big storm, and it flooded, and my eight-month pregnant wife was down there helping me in the middle of the night pull back carpet and move furniture in the middle of the night because our house was literally flooding. And then on the next day, a toilet in the top floor of the house over flooded, uh, and, flooded and, and, and water came running down, and all, all levels of our house were completely destroyed. I mean, we had to get new flooring. We had people in our house cutting out the ceiling. It was a mess. We had young kids. I mean, just picture like your worst like nightmare when it comes to your house. I mean, it happened. And it wasn't the first time that we lived in a construction zone. We had a home. We lived in uh, South Dakota uh, and had a basement that was unfinished. And we got this great idea that when we moved in, we were going to finish the basement ourselves. And so we started working on it, and, and man, it was, it was a construction project, sheetrock dust everywhere, and tools, and nails, and cords. I mean, it was just, it was a nightmare. But the good thing about that project is I could walk out of the basement, and I could walk up into the first floor of the house that was finished, and I could leave the mess behind. But whether you've been in a big construction project before, or you've just done little stuff around your house, you know that trying to live in a mess is no fun. And when you don't get control of your fitness, when you don't take care of being healthy with the one body God gave you, it's trying to live your life in a house that's falling apart. It's like living your life in a house that's been flooded, that's under construction. It's it's trying to drag your body along to accomplish all the things God's asked you to do, and your body's not wanting to cooperate. Now, there's some things that are certainly out of all of our hands, and none of us will live forever. All of these bodies will pass away. We know that. Unless Jesus comes back in our lifetime, our bodies will die in in some way, shape, or form. But it's about doing what we can do to stay healthy. And, you know, for all of us, there's certain things we can control when it comes to how we eat, whether or not we exercise, how much sleep we get. And if you don't take care of your health, if, if we're not healthy, then we don't have the energy, and here's why this matters. We don't have the energy to accomplish what God has for us to do. We we miss the opportunity to care for and love for others at full capacity. We don't don't have the energy and strength we need to do it to to serve God and to serve his purposes, to minister to others. If we're we're not healthy, we don't have the energy to do that. And, And let's talk about a long lifespan. God wants to use you for as long as he has you here on earth, and he wants to use you to help others, to bless the world, to serve. And if you don't take care of your body, the number of years you're here will be a lot less. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. It says, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now, as believers in Jesus, we all, we all get it. We, we believe that spiritual training is more important than physical training, and that our spiritual lives are more important than the physical. We are, we're all, I think, hopefully I'm bored with that. But I think what a lot of believers do is they skip over the first part of verse 8, and they jump to the fact that godliness, training in godliness is more important. So we go after that, and we do that, which we should. That's the priority. But we forget that it says physical training also has some value. The, the God actually says it's valuable to take care of your body. It's important. Why? Because if you take care of the one body God gave you, then you can do more for God while you're here. You'll have more energy and life to bring into the life that he's given you here on earth. And so it's very important to experience health when it comes to our our fitness. But sometimes we give up and we think, well, little things don't matter. And we let things slip, right? So how how are you doing in your your exercise and and how how you're eating, how you're taking care of your body, what you're putting into your body? Are you resting your body and replenishing it? Some of us right now, we're kind of like sinking back in our seats. We're thinking, man, why did I come today? Right? Well, that, that's, a, that's a good thing that you're feeling that way. That's a, that's a good kind of hurt. We call that conviction, right? So, so God set you up for that. He put you here today. And, and you know what? When I was a kid and I fell and I skinned my knees, you know what my mom and dad would do? They'd take that hydrogen peroxide. And they'd just pour that stuff all over my knee. they say, this is going to sting a little bit. And I, I was focused on the little bit, but the sting was actually the part that I remember. And, and they said it's a good, a good kind of hurt because it's going to help you. It's going to keep your, your knee from getting affected. And, and maybe today as we talk about our fitness, our finances, and fun and becoming healthy, it's going to be a good kind of a hurt. Because if you can get there, if you can get healthier in any of these areas, it's going to help you be freed up to run faster toward whatever it is that God wants you to do in your life. Whatever mission he has you on, it's going to help fuel that mission. You have more health in your body, it's going to give you more energy to do what God wants you to do. 
But again, we sometimes let things slip because we think, well, the little things don't matter. And I'll just remind you that every small step you make either inches you closer to your dream or toward disaster. Every, every step, every, everything you do, it, it moves you in one direction or another. It's not neutral. So if you take care of your body this week, it's going to get you closer to where you want to be or it's going to move you closer to where you don't want to be. And, and, and all of this matters. And I think success in this area is a sum total of many small choices. Just like Galatians 6, chap, chapter 6 says, it's, it's planting, it's sowing the seed, and then, and then you will harvest what you plant. Right? You, you don't plant for tomatoes and then reap bananas. Right? Like you, you, you get what you sow. And so some of us, some of us are expecting a, a different result than what we're planting in our lives. And so how are you doing? How, how are you doing when it comes to taking care of our bodies? Now, there's a physical aspect that we could talk about. We're not going to talk about it uh, because there's volumes of books written on it. There's, you can get online and watch videos on health and what to eat and what not to eat. Exercise programs are endless, uh, all kinds of gyms and things that you got. I mean, there's just endless stuff that you can do to take care of your body and all kinds of research. Maybe that's the problem. There's so much of it we don't know what to do because everybody's saying something different. You know, one of my friends, uh, his dad had like the best program for fitness I've ever heard of, the most simple plan. He said, move more and eat less. I'm like, okay, I can do that. That, that helps me out. That's nice and simple. But, you know, we could, we could talk about the, the specifics of, you know, how they know that fish or chicken are better for you than red meats or how fruit and veggies and salads are better than sweets and real bready stuff and you know fried stuff is not as good for you as grilled stuff and we, we could get into talking about that there's a whole world out there of fitness but I don't think that would be sufficient to actually change your life it might give you motivation for the week but I don't think it's going to sustain we know this how because new year's resolutions are almost all done by March, right? Like you've done that before, 90 days, and you get through like day 30, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm tapped out, I did it. And here's why, it's because there's the physical, but then there's a, there's a spiritual aspect to it that should be our true motivation. You wanna get in shape, not so you look good for somebody else, but so you wanna, you wanna take care of your body so that you can honor God with it. Here it is, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So, so our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. When you, when you ask God for forgiveness, you say, Father, I, I, I'm a sinner. I need your grace. And, and, and you're forgiven through Jesus. He, he's forgiven you of your sins, you're following him, you're a believer. He gives you his Holy Spirit to live inside you and your body then becomes like a temple of the Holy Spirit who is inside you. He lives in you, he moves in you. And that's the conviction that you feel when you start to get up. That's the Holy Spirit prompting you and you pray for God to lead and guide you. That's the Holy Spirit that guides you and directs you. It's your counselor, he advises you. And that's the, the, the nudging that you have inside and, and you know what's right and what's wrong. That's the Holy Spirit. And it says your body is his temple. And so it says to honor God with your bodies. And you know, we could talk about this in terms of our sexuality. That's what it references here in Corinthians, honoring God with your body. You could talk about what substances can harm your body and honoring him in that way. But let's talk about fitness for a minute. Honor God with your bodies. What does it look like for me to honor God as an act of worship with, with my body. If, if you viewed what you did with your body as an act of worship, how's your worship when it comes to your fitness? Now, some people take this, the other extreme, and they, they, they do fitness so much because, not because they're worshiping God, but because they're worshiping themselves, or let's get real, they want other people to worship them. They want to have a good body so that, they, you know, swimsuit season's coming, or, you know, all of the other guys say, you know, see, man, man, this guy, he's got it going on. It's, it's, it's worship, but not worship of God. It's worship of self. So you can get off track here and, and either side of it, but a balanced, healthy life when it comes to our fitness is I'm, I'm taking care of the one body God gave me because, as it says here, I am not my own. This is his body. He created it. He gave it to me. I'm going to honor him with it, and I'm going to do everything I can to honor God with my body. So, so how's it coming with your fitness? You know, baseball legend Mickey Mantle who lived a good long life. He says, if I had known that I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of my body. 
I, I would have taken better, better care of it if I would have known I was going to live this long. It was June 6, 1944, a day that if you're a history person, you know what happened. That was the day that the Allies invaded Normandy, France, and it was a world war, and it was an important day. It was a crucial day, and, and they were trained up for it. And before dawn, the airborne troops of the Allies, the British and American soldiers, they, they, they dropped in, and they were uh, attacking, and it was important for them to be a the utmost of physical condition for this battle, and so they were. Some said that they were trained to the level of professional boxers. I mean, they were physically fit. They were ready. They descended in on the enemy. On the other hand, historians tell us that the Germans who had occupied this area of France for four years had become apathetic and lazy. They were more, consider, they were more uh, concerned with setting up their barracks and, and, and different defenses than they were of conditioning themselves. They didn't, they didn't get involved in PT, taking care of their body, physical training. They didn't, they didn't exercise. They just kind of became apathetic. Many of them divorced their wives back in Germany and married French women, and they just kind of settled in. And for them, they lost sight of the fact that they were in a battle and they were just occupying. And so when the Allies attacked, they were in much better physical condition. They said that, that some of the, the Germans, once they were intruded once they got to where they were in the, the trenches they simply surrendered they just they couldn't take it physically they said that there were some Germans who were reported to have died in the in the trenches without a bullet in their body and they they figured that they had died literally from exhaustion of being um, on attention for 24 7 when their bodies were not trained for that so when you're in a battle being physically healthy is important let me give you another example is the Six-Day War back in June 1967, the Egyptians and the Israelis who we would think would be conditioned mentally and physically to battle in, in extreme heat and desert conditions. But the Israelis won in a short amount of time. They said the, the Egyptians, more of them died of heat exhaustion and dehydration than did from the actual battle. The difference was the Israelis, they drank a liter of water every hour and they stayed hydrated and they won the battle. So when you're in a battle, these examples show when you're in a battle, your, your physical health is important. Did you know that you and I are in a battle? We have an enemy that wants to destroy us, destroy those we love, destroy God's plans for our lives. The devil is out to destroy. He, it's re he's real. God has, on the other hand, a great mission for your life, a great purpose for your life. Part of being fit and healthy in your life not perfect physically, none of us are, and not living forever, none of us will live in these bodies forever, but doing the best today with what God's given you to stay healthy allows you to fight the battles God has for you with all, the, all of your might. So when you stay healthy, when you, when, you, when you take care of the fitness in your life, it's a way of honoring God. God says, honor me with your body. It's a, it's a spiritual activity. It's not just the physical. And why? It's so that you can have your best to bring to your family, to your loved ones, to, to serve in the way that God wants you to serve. So fitness. Let's talk about finances. Finances. Getting healthy with our finances. You know, many people are unhealthy here and it really hurts us. It really hurts us relationally. They say one of the top reasons marriages split up is because of the financial pressure that's on that relationship, it's on, on that marriage. A lot of people are drowning in debt, overextended, undisciplined. You know, they, they, they get online on Amazon or they walk through a mall and they just lose self-control, just lose their mind, you know, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's prevalent in our culture that, that our finances are, are not submitted to God and being led by God, but they're, they're they're off and they're, they're hurt us. Money, they say, has yet to make anybody rich. And part of the unhealth that comes to our finances is pursuing money in a way that we think it'll satisfy us. We, we chase treasures and pleasures to satisfy what only God can satisfy in us. And until you get healthy in your approach and how you think about finances and how you think about this area of your life, man, you'll not be freed up to really live in the way God wants you to live. Debt, careless spending, lack of discipline in this area, it can ruin you. Yet when you get it right, it can reward you. It can help you. In the same way, we talked about fitness. It's not about all those details of how you eat and, and what you eat and exercise and all that. And you need all that kind of stuff and how you sleep. There's, there's a science to that and, and go get that and figure that out. But the, the change agent is it's, it's the spiritual. Same is true with your finances. You, need, you probably need to learn how to, to live on a budget if, if you're not. You probably need to, to learn some, some things, get some counseling, get some help, some, some advice 
maybe learn to manage things differently. There's all kinds of tools to do that, but we're not going to talk about that because that's the application. That's what we need to go do. But the core, the motivation, what changes us is to understand this from a spiritual perspective, that we worship God, we don't worship money. And once you understand this and you see that everything in this world is created by God and everything that we have, even if you'd say, I, I earned it, I worked for it, it's all his as a believer in Jesus, it's all God's, that's when things actually start to change for us. The verse that you have on the offering envelopes that we give you on the way in is found in Proverbs chapter 3, Ch- chapter 3, verse 9. It says this, it says, honor the Lord with your wealth. Now, we always talk about that verse in terms of, uh, you know, giving. You know, we honor God by giving to him and to his church and making an impact in the world, helping others. But I want you to zoom out a little bit with me and think about it from a, a bigger picture perspective today. Honor God with your wealth. What does that look like to honor God with everything? So when I, when I spend money, am I honoring God with that money? Through, through my earnings, am I, am I honoring God? And wh- whether I decide to go for a medium size this or an extra large, that's, that's a, in, in some ways it's a worship decision. Is, am, I, am I honoring God with this? Am I, if I decide to upgrade something or go new instead of used or vice versa, I mean, that's, a, that's part of my worship. That's part of, am I honoring God with my wealth? You know, what choices I make in my spending or saving or generosity, these are all how I honor God with my wealth. It's how I get healthy. It's am I honoring God. It's, it's all his. And so, God, how do you want me to live? How do you want me to honor you? It goes on, it says, with the first fruits of all your crops, we honor him. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So, you know, we, we, we tend to focus on this verse, you know, when, when I give and then, and then God blesses, but, but it says honor God with your wealth. So backing up, big picture, as I honor God in every part of my, my life, he delivers blessing. It's an if-then kind of thing. What, what financial, Christian financial author and, and expert Dave Ramsey calls financial peace. The blessing is the financial peace that God delivers in your life when you honor him in every area of your life. So when you spend less than you make, instead of spending more than you make, that's a worship decision. That's not just a practical financial decision. We could talk about budgets and how to do that and how to control your spending but, or how to earn more, but, but all that's the practical. The spiritual is this is all God's and am I honoring him with it? Am I, am I managing well what God has entrusted to me to care for? See, let's, let's go after the heart of this. Jesus said it so well in Matthew chapter six. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't do it. You can't serve both God and money. So who are you serving? Who are you living for? Are you living for self or are you living for God in this area? You know, the root issue is do we turn to the treasures of this life to satisfy us more than we turn to God? I had an experience with my kids that just... And just it humbled me and it, it impacted me. It's still resonating with me this last week. Uh, I, I pulled out these, these little bags, these little envelopes that I have for each of my four kids. And I, I've been doing this for a long time. And I, I give them a small amount of, of money each month. And I try to teach them financial lessons while they're young. Because as a pastor, a lot of the people that I've counseled, a lot of the heartache in their life comes back to bad decisions. And a lot of, it, a lot of times it's financial decisions that they made. So I want to teach them at a young age how to manage what God gives them. And my parents did it for me when I had a paper out and I made 10 bucks. They said, give the first dollar back to God, save a dollar and live on the rest, okay? And so they, they taught me some of those principles when I was a kid. So I've been doing this with my kids. So I gave them all $5 for this month and uh, handed it to them. And one of my boys did what all the other kids did. He gave me a dollar back and he said, hey, dad, put this in the God envelope. And we have a God envelope and we put their money in there that they give and we save it up and then we, we give it, you know, and there's an amount of money in there. And, and, and they don't have very much, but that dollar is a big deal, you know, and so that, that's really cool. And, and one of my sons took a big chunk of his money that he'd saved up for a long time. He took $20, he just did this this week, and he, he gave $20. He said, Dad, I want you to put this in the God envelope, unprompted by me. I, temp- I simply had talked to him about how cool that was that he gave the $1 and how God will bless him for that, and, and he gave $20. And I was blown away. I was almost like, wow, son, that's a lot. Are you sure that's a lot? You, remember, you say it a long time. And he's like, no, I, I want to do this. His other brother did the same thing. He's like, well, I want to do it too. And he gave $20. They both they put this in the God envelope, dad. 
And then my other son, it almost became like, a, I know this was not his heart, but it almost felt in the moment like, hey, we're going to one-up each other, you know. But he's like, well, Dad, I want to give all my money to God, <laughs> you know. But I could see it in his eyes. He, he was genuine. He was like, I, I, you know, it, it is all God, so just here, take it all. And I was, I was blown away by that because he had saved for so long, and he said, it's all God's. And you know what? I, I said, you know what? We're going to put this $20 that you gave in the God envelope. I want you to hold on to the rest, but here, I think you've learned the lesson. You've learned the lesson, man. The, here's the lesson. All of it is God's, and you're managing it for him. So why don't you hold on to this, and why don't you manage it? Why don't, why don't you do with it what you think God would want you to do with it? You know, you can use it. You can enjoy it. You can use it to bless others. You can do a lot of different things with it, but why don't you manage that? But you see the lesson here. It's, it's all God's. And I was, I was so deeply impacted by that because it came from a young child who's getting it. It's, it's not mine. And in the same way when we talked about fitness, the Bible says, honor God with your bodies because you are not your own. If we could understand this on a spiritual level, my home, my apartment, condo, my, my vehicle, SUV, my minivan, it's, it's, it's not mine, right? Right, whatever you have, it, my 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 tools are are not mine. My my stuff's not mine. My, my clothes on my back. It's God. It's all yours. So when you view life that way, you see someone in need. The Bible uses the example literally of the shirt off your back. Well, I see someone who's not clothed. I'm gonna let me let me help you out. I, it's it's all yours, God. So how do you want to use it? How do you want see? You can you can see how God could use somebody who's freed up and doesn't have that control. It's like I'm worshiping stuff. I'm worshiping money, I'm worshiping finances, it's, it's all about me. And it starts to become more about God and what he wants to do in your life. And once we get this on a spiritual level that God, it's all yours, it frees you up. It really, it, you go from like this to like, all right, God, it's all yours, what do you want me to do with it? And you can worship God, you can enjoy it, you can share it. I mean, there's so many things you can do with it, but it's, it's not about you anymore, it's about God. God, what pleases you? And God loves to see his kids happy. I think we have a fear which comes from a lack of trust in God. Well, if I surrender everything to God, maybe God will, will have me give it all to him. Well, he will. <laughs> He'll ask for all of it. But once you give it all to him and say, God, it's all yours, then you're freed up to, to, to live for him and, and, and you can enjoy what you have, you can share what you have, you can save what you have, you can give what you have. See, there's a lot of things you can do with it, but until you release it all and say, God, it's all yours truly, God, however you wanna use me, however you wanna use this stuff that you put in my life, man, you're not really free. You're still kind of controlled by it. Even, I think even when new believers start to like give to God, it's like we, we give like a part of it to God and we're like, right, God, here's yours and the rest is mine. That's not what God, God doesn't want just a part of our heart. He wants it all. He, he wants to say, literally, God, whatever you want, it's all yours. And, and then you might give a part of it away and you'll probably spend a lot of it on life and bills and taking care of all that and that's great. You might share some with others. You might use some to enjoy life. It, it's all good, but it's, it's, it, now it's repurposed. It's rebranded. It's not, it's not your name on it. It's God's name on it. I mean, doesn't our money say in God we trust? So, so do we? Do we trust in God or what we, what my mentor calls us, uh, Pastor Kevin Myers, are, are we what he calls an economic atheist? Where we believe in God, but when it comes to our money, we're actually atheists because we don't actually believe that God is able to provide for us and care for his kids and that if we surrender that area to our life, that he'll actually be able to care for us. See, it, it starts small and it starts early and if you could get this right, I'll tell you, it'll impact your life. Derek Carr, Oakland Raiders quarterback. If you're an NFL fan, you've heard his name. He's a superstar young quarterback. Just in the last few weeks, this has been the big headline news. He got the biggest contract ever by an NFL player. Uh, picture this, $125 million contract over a five-year period. So his annual salary is $25 million. I don't even know how you'd spend that kind of money, but $25 million a year for five years, biggest contract ever. This guy's a committed Christian, he's a committed believer. He, always, he wasn't always in his life. In fact, in the past, the woman who's now his wife wrote him a letter and said, you're not the guy who I thought you were. And he used that as motivation to analyze his life and realize where he's at. He asked God's forgiveness, started living for God, and he's a genuine, legit believer in Christ. And he was interviewed, and this made, made headlines, and he, he was on this contract. What are you gonna do with the money? This is what he said in a national public forum, CBS Sports. He said, the first thing I'll do is pay my tithe like I have since I was in college, Carr told CBS Sports. He said, I gave $700 on a college scholarship check. That won't change. I'll, I'll do that. So even when he had relatively little and he got a check in college for a scholarship, he tithed, and he's like, now the, the, the dollars are much bigger, but I'm still gonna do what I've always done. I'm gonna honor God. 
He says, the exciting thing for me, money-wise, honestly, is that money is going to help a lot of people. I'm very thankful to have it, that it's that's in our hands because it's going to help people, not only in this country, but in a lot of other countries around the world. Here's a believer that's saying publicly, hey, you know what I'm going to do with this income that God's given me is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless others. I'm going to honor God. And it started when he was faithful with little, and God gave him a lot more. And he's honoring God with more because he was faithful with little. And some of us, we feel like we have little and we're waiting until God gives us more because then we're going to share it with others. Then we're going to surrender it to God and, and it just won't happen. He talks about tithing, which is only one aspect of our finances, but a very important one because it's a statement that we make about whose it actually is. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, it says, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Tithe means tenth, the first tenth of what God gives you, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So again, it's test me in this. Honor me in this and see if I will not bless you and throw open the floodgates of heaven. It's if then, if we honor him. If we go from maybe giving nothing to doing something, from moving from something to being more strategic about it, the goal of tithing is, is where we're inspired to go to. And, and believers in Christ throughout the centuries have always also given of offerings. It's above and beyond. You, you see someone in need, you help out. You help the poor. You, you give generously when there's opportunities to use your finances to make a, a kingdom difference. So getting healthy makes an incredible impact. You saw on the way in today, you were given with the weekly, there's a piece of paper folded up under there, summer impact offering. Over these next few months, what we get to do together is we're going to write a check each month to help out a different cause to expand God's kingdom, to help those in need. And we've been doing this since, literally since day one, since we started, helping those in need, giving ourselves away. Now, we're being wise with what God's given us. And we've aggressively been saving since the beginning, and we're saving up to get into our own space. We won't be here in the school forever. We got even some spaces that we're looking at right now, and we're, we're open to where God leads us, and, and that day may come soon. And so we're preparing for that. We're being wise, and we're caring for the ministry. But we also are not waiting until we're a 10-year-old established church that has our own building to, to give to others. From the very beginning, we've, we've tried to help the poor and help start other churches. You'll see in two weeks from now a, a church planner up on this stage. His name is Raphael Bellini. He's planning a church in Spring Hill, Florida. We're going to send our very first church experience missions trip up to Spring Hill to help them launch that new church. We're going to hand him a significant check and say, here's thousands of dollars to help you go launch this new church up there. We're going to be behind you. And it's not the first church we've partnered with that way. We've given to a lot of other churches. We're, you're going to hear about uh, every month. We're going, to, we're going to increase and ramp up communication and show you some pictures and videos of things that you're doing that we're doing together to help others. We're going to partner again with uh, Treasures of Africa, an, an orphanage that helps young kids whose parents have died of AIDS. We're going to help local orphans in our community. Unleash Compassion. There's uh, Suncoast Voices uh, for Children. You know, kids in the foster care system, they, they get the basics covered, and their food and their, their, a roof over their head and clothes on their back, but that's about all they get in some cases. And so they come alongside and help kids with, with other needs. In some cases, prevent the need for fostering to begin with. Maybe a grandma who's trying to keep the kids together but is required to have a certain amount of beds and she can't afford it, and they, they come alongside and help. And, and we're getting to be a part of those causes. You can read about all of them and some more causes, World Hope International. A lot of things that we're going to do to help those in need to expand God's kingdom. We get to do that kind of stuff. We get to do ministry week in, week out. We get to move ahead and advance into new territory, God willing, because of your generosity. When believers get excited about being healthy with their finances, God can do incredible things in and through our lives. All right, let's talk about this third area. Your discipline will reward you or ruin you when it comes to your fun. Now, I know there's somebody here that's saying, all right, finally, I have fitness. Man, I was feeling conviction there. And then when he talked about finances, I was really feeling the conviction. But let's talk about fun, okay? Because I just want to talk about having me some fun. And, and fun is a good topic to talk about. I mean, we're, 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 we're meant to have fun. God created fun. He created laughter. He created joy. He says, be joyful always. Rejoice in the Lord always. A cheerful heart, it says in Proverbs, is good medicine. You know, God wants you to be joyful. He wants you to experience Life and in the fullness, Jesus, John 10, 10, I came to give life to the full. But you know, in this area of fun, your, your fun can either reward you or it can ruin you. And we know how it can reward us. That's pretty obvious. There's a lot of life-giving, life-replenishing ways to chase fun. But unfortunately, the danger of it is that it can also get you sucked into time wasters and pleasure chasers that if you're reckless and careless, can destroy God's work in your life. 
it can ruin God's work in your life. How do you know? Well, if your fun is pulling you away from your family or your fun is pulling you away from your faith, then you know it's not God honoring. If, if it's pulling you away from the relationships that matter most, your relationship with God and, and your relationship with your family, friends, those around you, you know it's probably not a good thing in your life. So how you doing? What kind of fun are you engaging in? Are you putting the label of fun on something that might be sinful? Another weekend and hey, you know, it's maybe not a God-honoring thing that you're a part of and you're thinking, man, I need to reevaluate that. I'm calling it fun, but maybe it's, Maybe it's not fun at all in the end. Maybe it's something that's going to ruin what God wants to do in my life. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. That spirit that lives inside you gives you the discipline, the self-control to overcome whatever it is that you feel like you're wrapped up in that, that might have started as fun, but might be hurting God's plans for your life. God wants you to be self-controlled. So don't don't ignore whatever the issues are that maybe need to be addressed. Surrender them to God and say, God, I need your help. God wants our lives to please him holistically in our fun, whatever we're chasing, whatever we're doing with our free time, with our finances, with our fitness. When these three areas are healthy, here's, here's the main thing today. If we could be healthier in these three areas, how much more freed up would we be as a people, as individuals, to chase what God has for us? If we could live our lives for God in these three areas of our fitness, finances, and fun, if we could be healthier, man, what could God do? How much more fun would it literally be to chase God's plans for our life if we were healthier, if we were freed up? It's not going to happen overnight. I mean, if you've dug yourself in a hole in one of these three areas, it might take some time to get out. But, but again, every step, every day, every choice you make, it either inches you closer to your dream or closer to disaster. So, so don't wait, don't prolong it. If today is the day. If you know God's saying, make a step, I'm gonna give you a moment here when we pray to, to ask God that, God, what step do you want me to take? Take it today. Make a commitment to God. Get accountability. Make a plan. Because as you move ahead and getting healthier, you will be rewarded for your steps in moving closer to God. So in your fitness, is your motivation to give glory to God with your body or to please yourself with your body? And your fun, is, is it... Is it about pleasure for you or is it a way of worshiping God through the activities that you enjoy and that God wants you to enjoy? It's a, it's a part of your worship. Thank you, God, that I get to enjoy life in you. In your fitness or in your finances, is it, is it all for me or is it all God's and I get to manage it? See, you can get there from wherever here is for you. You can get there and there's a better day ahead. God has more for you. He wants to do some great things, I believe, with all my heart. The best is yet to come, but you have to put your life in his hands, your resources in his hands, your health in his hands, your free time in his hands, and say, God, it's all yours. How can I best please you and live a life of joy and peace in your presence? If you'll do that, you'll find that God will honor and reward you for honoring him. Right on. Thanks for joining us at Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out the website if you'd like to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially. You're now going to hear a Church Experience Worship original song, and we hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today. It's time.